Good morning. Bienvenidos. Bienvenu. Welcome in. We're ready to start our program. First of all, I would like to say how exciting and fun it is to see everybody face to face. We're not on the little squares on the, on the screen. Um, so welcome. It's great to have you here. We're happy to have you here, especially after three years of not doing this. We appreciate where you're coming from, um, no matter how far and no matter how close. It is always good to be together um, to share our passion and our love for languages. Before uh, we move on, um, I would like to express our gratitude to the planners, the coordinators of this day. They are Sarah Thatcher, <laughs> Thomasina White, Sister Mary Helen, Edith Gay, and Rich Madel, and Mary, Mary Wells. Oh, there you are, and Mary Wells. Thank you, thank you. Um, so a couple of uh, housekeeping things. We have coffee and pastries and water over there. The restrooms are right out here. When you go out these doors, make a right. The ladies' room is straight ahead. The men's room is go out here, make a right, and then make a quick left, and then another right. And, uh, so, and you can ask any of us if you need directions. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Edith, who will introduce our feature speaker today. Um, just one more thing, I'm sorry, one more thing. <laughs> Rebecca is from American College of Education. Rebecca, will you tell us a little bit about your uh, enter to win? Sure, um, okay, so I don't love public speaking, so my face is, oh gosh, and I got the microphone, so we're really going all out. So my face is probably going to get really red and then purple, and then if I say it now, hopefully it'll go back down to normal. Um, I'm Regina. I'm from the American College of Education. Um, we offer lots of continuing ed programs for teachers and educators. Um, we have master's degrees, doctoral programs, but also micro-credentials and certificates, which are great if you've got your master's, you're working towards that master's plus 30, master's plus 45, or there's a specific content area that you'd like to learn a little bit more about. Um, we work to keep our tuition prices as low as possible, and we also offer a 3% tuition reduction with partnering school districts. And I'd be happy to facilitate a conversation with any of your school districts, um, you know, to build that partnership if we don't already have that. Um, yeah, so I've got my little uh, QR code at your tables, and here we're giving out an Amazon gift card today. Thank you so much for having me. You're really natural at this. <laughs> so we are grateful to the American College of Education, to East Strasburg University, and to Vista Higher Learning for their support for today. Okay, Edith. Now it's my turn. Good morning, bonjour, buenos dias. Good and talk this morning. I'm really happy to be here this morning. I got so excited when I saw Chestnut Hill College this morning. I was like, oh my gosh, I've not been here for three years. And it feels good to see each of you in person. So thank you for being here to, um, to start to continue a conversation about DEI uh, in the classroom, the word language classroom. So Ben Tinsley, our presenter, is a teacher at uh, Germantown Academy. He will facilitate our conversation this morning. In the first part of the workshop, Ben will focus on the process of developing a proficiency-based unit that, center on the, that centers the cultural practices and products of historically marginalized people and the, the breakout sessions will be dedicated to the math talk activity in the target language. I hope you will enjoy Ben's presentation and especially his philosophy. And you, if you don't know him, you will know why I, said, I say that. I also hope that you will be as inspired as I have been every time I, attended his, I attend his workshops. And why? Because it helped me to promote the idea of recognition of all individuals in the classroom and in our society. On his website, I'm going to quote him because there is a sentence that always catches my attention. Uh, his website is Afrofranco, and the sentence goes like this. I've been blessed with the opportunity to work with students and educators from all around the world to develop curriculum and pedag pedagogy that serve as both windows and mirrors. And those two words have always stayed with me from the very first time I saw them. 
So I, I find them very inspiring. So this morning, let's open windows together and hold mirrors. On that note, Ben. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Um, happy early, very early Saturday morning. Uh, it's very early. Like I got up at an hour that I don't typically get up on a Saturday, but uh, I'm really excited. My name again is Ben Tinsley, he, him, il. And I teach upper school now. I teach in a proficiency-based, comprehensible input, acquisition-driven style classroom in which we center black and brown people and other historically marginalized people every day. And so a lot of my goal today is to walk you through some of the framework that I've just been tinkering with over the last several years that's allowed me to do that and that's allowing me to continue to work on that and to, to work toward that aim. All right? Is that okay? So um, leaning into that, first I figured to establish what some of the pain points are, what, is, what are some of the things that are in the way or the hurdles that we're sort of experiencing that keep us from being able to do that? And then hopefully by the end of the next three hours that I'm going to talk at you. It's not, it's not three hours. Uh, by the end of uh, this little conversation that we'll have, we'll see to what extent were we able to address some of those things. Or maybe are we asking the right questions in the first place? So let's see if we can get there. So first, one of the things that I hear a lot is um, how can we do this work in a world language classroom? Like, what does this even have to do? The work of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice, what does that even have to do with the world language classroom? My job is to get my kids to memorize all of the conjugations <laughs> for the subjunctive. And what does belonging and identity have to do with that? That's a real question, right? Like, we're giggling. But that's a thing that people, that's a hurdle that people have faced in terms of how they frame their work in the classroom. So maybe by the end of this, we can get an idea as to how we can address that. Um, also, the question of how do you do, if we want to do this at all, I teach middle school, I don't, but people will say, you know, I teach, my kids are lower level, earlier level students, so how can I make this accessible to that sort of student? I may understand how I can start bringing in some literature from La Negritude for upper level college students, but how on earth can I make this stuff accessible to the 12 year old in my classroom who's bouncing off the walls? Genuine concern or no? That's a real thing, yeah. So hopefully at some point today we'll be able to see if we can address that. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe we won't answer any of these questions, but hopefully we will. Um, another thing I hear a lot is where do I start, right? We spend a lot of time diagnosing and problematizing, but what can I actually do, right? And I sort of, I think I, what can I do now that we've established that there is this issue, right? We can, and that takes a lot of work to get there, to even, get everyone on the same page and acknowledging collectively that we have an issue of underrepresentation of people in the classroom. Once we've done all of the work to get there, what can we do in our classrooms now? Right, like what can we actually, in a tangible way, as teachers who have a million things on our plates, real thing or not? Um, considering how much we have going on, how can we actually start to address those issues? So, I wanted to share with you again this work that I've been doing, and I'm so thankful that, um, I'm so thankful for the many people and things that have inspired me to continue to fail at things miserably so that I can keep sort of tweaking and going back and adjusting and reflecting and all that. And what I've really landed on, or where I am now, is that I have these three sort of guiding principles that have really helped me in this quest to center black and brown people in the classroom, and importantly, to make it so that it's accessible to all of my students, that I don't just wait until I get to AP, if, if kids, you know, for the three kids who end up making it that far. <laughs> what about the 70 kids who are taking French in sixth grade? Can I do this with them? So I have three real sort of core values, guiding principles that have helped me, and continue to help me to do this work. 
And the first two sort of are in the like conceptual realm a bit. And then the third one is where we're gonna get our hands dirty and we'll go off into our breakout, room, breakout groups eventually. But it's, hopefully it will be something that can address the issue of what can I actually start doing now. So the first real principle that I've wedded myself to is committing to backward design. Committing to the idea that I have to, before I do anything, establish a desired outcome. I have to say, this is where I want to wind up. All too often, the diversity, equity, and inclusion work gets sort of treated as this like aspirational detour. Like, hopefully, at some point, I can put up a picture of somebody who's black in the classroom. It'll probably be on February 1st, and March 1st is coming down. And other, <laughs> or no, right? And so if I get a chance to get there, or in my quest to teach the subjunctive, I got issues with the subjunctive, y'all, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? <laughs> Clearly I got some unhealed trauma. Um, I'm sorry y'all have to be here while I work that out. <laughs> but on my way, right, so we'll, we'll establish this sort of like grammar goal, and then we're gonna try to use culture to teach grammar. So clearly, the, there's something that's been established as being central, and then hopefully we'll be able to use something else, use someone else to help me teach this other thing that I've clearly established, whether I say that explicitly, but more importantly, what's implicitly received by the students as being central, as being what's most important to our classroom. So by starting with backward design, it, it gives me this opportunity to, to A, decide that there actually is an outcome that I hope, you know, like that there's a destination that I really hope to get my students to. That I'm not just opening up to page one, <laughs> and then we're gonna do exercises one, two, three, and four, and tomorrow we're gonna be on page two. And then the next day, guess what? Page three, y'all. So instead of doing that, I establish what my desired outcomes are, and importantly, I can communicate them clearly and unapologetically to my students. This is where we intend to wind up. By the end of this unit, there are real things that I'm gonna hopefully, hopefully equip you to be able to do. And at the end of this unit of this learning experience, you, learner, are gonna be able to tell to what extent you're able to do those things. So it, it, again, allows me to establish some sort of communicative and proficiency-based outcome. But what it also does is that it's at this stage in planning that I can choose to center historically marginalized people in my outcomes. My goal isn't to maybe include some black and brown people in my unit. But my goal is to center the cultural practices and products there. It's at this stage in the planning process that I can say, this is what we're doing. Everything else we do is in service of that. Every other learning experience that we do throughout this unit is in service of the idea of centering historically marginalized people. Acknowledging, especially, the people are not inherently marginal, but they're marginalized, right? And so as we sort of, uh, here I can click to the next joint. Uh, as we sort of work through this stuff, the, the, his, the issue of underrepresentation is one that requires deliberate action and that happens in the beginning planning stages. And it allows us to have that centering of the cultural practices and products and perspectives of historically marginalized people. Not to be that aspirational detour, but that we're centering it. It also, when I decide to do that, and I'll walk into this a little bit more, when I decide to approach it like that, it allows me to then start building toward that goal. If my goal, if I've established a particular goal, then I can say, what tools do my students need in order to get there? So what it does is sort of liberates the teacher a little bit to say, I don't, the kids don't really need to know every form of the subjunctive. <laughs> <laughs> I got issues, y'all. I'm telling you, I'm trying to work through it. Um, yeah, but you can say, like, as much as I, I think it would be important for the kids to be able to use the conditional, but do they actually need it to do this? 
And do, if they need it, do I need to have it be a whole little sub, do I need to give them a test on all of the forms of that? So when you sort of map out what your destination is, you can say, you can start to trim the fat of what it is that you're gonna be teaching and decide like what, it, what particular grammar points actually should be taught. Do they need to be taught explicitly? Can I use other techniques and other strategies to get students to internalize some of those structures? Can I give them other contexts first to use those, that vocabulary and those structures that they can then later apply to the summative goal? So I can build those learning activities according to whatever I've established is my goal there. What I also choose to do here is that a lot of times when we think of backward design, which is fine, it's not a bad thing. When we think of backward design, we'll pick an authentic source. Y'all familiar with this process at all? You'll choose an authentic source, and then you'll build this integrated performance assessment in which the authentic source is gonna have an interpretive task, yeah, where the students are gonna demonstrate their ability to show their, comp they're gonna have an opportunity to demonstrate comprehension of the main idea and supporting details, whatever. That's great, yeah. But instead of starting with the interpretive task in this process of backward design, here we have, y'all familiar with this document? So I don't see the thing, do y'all see the thing? There it is. So we can look at what our target proficiency benchmarks are and then you have the interpretive task that ideally integrates into an interpersonal task that ideally integrates into a presentational task, right? But instead of starting there, what I've been able to do that's really fostered my ability to center historically marginalized people is to actually start here in the intercultural communication proficiency benchmarks. And what I've learned there is that A, it not only allows me to center historically marginalized people and start to mitigate that issue of marginalization of people, but it also establishes, it also fosters proficiency growth through the other modes too. So if you just take a look here, in my own and other cultures, I can make comparisons between products and practices to help me understand perspectives. And what's been so powerful for me there is that it centers people. What it does is that it says in my classroom, all these other modes are only useful in helping me see that there's another human being on the end of this conversation that all of the diagramming of sentences in the world won't help me if I can't see that there's a human being who interacts with the world based on where they live, who they worship, who, what other languages they speak. It centers the personhood of people in the language classroom. That then also allows the students to be centered too because it says in my own and other cultures. So in order to learn about another culture, and I'll uh, address that language in a second, I have to necessarily be able to look at my own as well. It establishes that culture is not just this thing of the other. Sometimes in classrooms we can look at culture and we're teaching culture and it's like, well, in Africa people have culture, but we're normal. <laughs> right, that these students and ourselves, we can take for granted that the ways that we see the world, the things that we believe to be universally true, are not actually universally true. So once we start this idea of seeing the underlying cultural, common cultural values that end up being manifested through these cultural practices and products, that we also can start to look critically at some of our own cultural practices and products. And examples that always come to mind, I talk about this a lot, like I've been blessed to be able to travel a decent amount in the world. I've never ever, other than in the United States, I've never seen someone eating a meal in the car. <laughs> Y'all ever see that? You see somebody like at a stoplight with like a Five Guys burger, like <laughs> eating. What does that mean? Right, what cultural perspective is really being manifested through that practice of like hustling so much that you gotta wolf this burger down for, between this place and that? So that we have this, if we're learning about another culture's practices, products, and perspectives, necessarily it gives us this opportunity to learn more about ourselves. In order to compare and contrast those things, I'm gonna learn as a student in this class that the way how I greet my friends is not universal. That an exchange student or someone who's coming to our school is gonna be like, oh wow, they dap each other up quite a bit. 
They shake hands more than once. Right? That's not a universal practice. The people hug, or maybe they don't. That you snack throughout the day. It's a biggie. Right? That's a real thing. I just, this is random, and whatever, y'all gave me a microphone, so deal with it. Uh, but my family and I were in Colombia this past summer. My wife's family is from Colombia. And that was a real thing that had like consequences for us. Is that my kids, my children, I have three kids, they just graze all day. Like my son could eat an apple an hour for eternity. Right? But in Colombia, they just didn't do that. And so they would have breakfast, and then we'd have this enormous meal for lunch. And then we don't eat again until dinner. And dinner's like 8 p.m. And so my kids wouldn't eat their lunch. They'd like peck at it. And we'd have to explain, like, it's not, people are getting offended. Our family is getting offended by that. But it's not that he doesn't like the food. It is that he doesn't like the food. <laughs> but <laughs> it's also that, sorry. Um, we got a lot to work on in my house. But it's, it's also that my kids are not used to, like, not eating every hour. That's a cultural practice. And that has consequences when we interact with the rest of the world. So we have to, I had to explain to Tia Ermila that, like, the food is great. He's just never had this big a lunch. And they've never had to wait eight hours in between meals. And that's, you know, there's, there's real cultural implications. There's real social implications to us understanding that the ways how we interact with the world are not necessarily universal. So when I start with this, when I say that in my own and other cultures I can make comparisons, that it's going to, again, establish that the rest of these modes of communication are only there to help me better understand the rest of the world. To only there to help me better understand myself and the ways that I interact with the world. That language is only a tool to connect people. All of the sentence diagramming in the world isn't gonna do you more service than really being able to see the human beings that are on the other end of a conversation. The human beings whose poetry and whose literature you're gonna have the opportunity to read. That that is what comes first. So, I'm gonna work my way through this technology stuff, y'all. I'm figuring it out. So, <laughs> backward design is like the first real central piece to how I build uh, my practice and my, my sort of praxis in my classroom that allows me to center historically marginalized people. This, the next, uh, guiding principle, oh, I'm sorry, and that's there for y'all too. Uh, the next sort of guiding principle is leading with intellectual curiosity. One of the biggest pushbacks that I've gotten, uh, I'll say pushbacks, because people be defensive. But one of the biggest things that people say is like, well, I, kn I know about France. Like, I don't know anything about Africa, but I know about France, so that's what I'm gonna teach. I'd studied abroad in Sevilla, that's what I know. But what I also know is that Zaretta Hammond, y'all read, anybody read um, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain? If you haven't, it's a phenomenal book. I highly recommend it. And one of the things that she talks about is building this learning partnership in which your goal is to get students from being dependent learners who kind of need you for all of their knowledge building to becoming independent learners. So you are a facilitator in their continued growth. And then Frieri also talks about, in, in, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he talks about the issue of what he calls a banking model, right? So setting up your classroom such that the students are seen as these like empty vessels. And then it's your job to just sort of pour your expertise into their minds. Does that feel familiar in a classroom set up, right? Or no? So what ends up happening through that is that if you wait to be the expert, if you as a teacher are saying, I'm not gonna do this work until I become an expert, you're not gonna do it. Because you're not gonna become an expert, right? You're probably, I mean, maybe you will get your doctorate in this stuff, P.S. <laughs> but you're probably not ever gonna feel like you're an expert, so you're just gonna continue to lean on the things that you've been doing, which doesn't make you a bad person, especially not a bad teacher, but what it does do is perpetuate the marginalization of peoples. And it does not put you in a position to be able to offer those windows and mirrors for students in your classroom. So what I propose is that we lead with this curiosity in our classrooms. That we not wait until we feel like we're experts, but that we invite our students 
along what I like to think of as like this co-exploration. That as teachers we say explicitly, out loud, I don't know everything. And I'm excited about this opportunity to learn alongside you. I'm still growing as a teacher. Yes, I have M-E-D after my name, but that does not mean that I'm done. I'm still learning. I have a deficit in my own intercultural proficiency, and I cannot wait to invite y'all along with me on this learning journey. And a number of things come with that, right? So one, it establishes, again, that you are not an expert. It models, it models a certain humility and intellectual curiosity in front of your students. And, hmm, how do I put this? So one of the issues, right, that comes from this is people will say, all right, well, Ben, I don't know, I don't know about Africa, right? And I'm a middle-aged white woman. Am I really the one to be doing this? Am I the person? I'm a middle-aged white woman, but am I the person to be talking about Africa? And that's fair, but everybody's a middle-aged white woman, <laughs> right? Like so many of the language teachers are middle-aged white women. So what I say, well, what I mean when I say that importantly is that who are you waiting for to do it if not you? If not you, then who? Right, if, if it's not going to be those who make up the majority of our departments, is it, gonna, is it Ben's job then? Is it only Ben's job? You know, so what we end up doing when we establish that we have this, that we are going to co-explore along with our students is that we also, a side effect of that, is evenly distribute the work of this DEI stuff. This cannot just fall on the shoulders of those who themselves have these marginalized identities, because otherwise it does, right? Everybody gets mad at me when I say that part. Y'all mad? That's okay, that's part of it. That's part of growth, right? So curiosity over expertise says that I'm going to invite the students alongside me in this exploration. I'm going to give us guiding principles. I'm going to make sure that we have the tools to have what some may frame as difficult conversation. But really, it's my job as a teacher to model that for you. And that's another big part. If you're familiar with the world readiness standards, the five C's, yeah, you all know the five C's? The last one is communities, and the last sort of subsection of that is lifelong learning. We want our kids, we acknowledge that there's only, a, there's only so far in language proficiency that kids can go in our classrooms themselves, right? So we know that much. We know that, to a certain extent, our job is to get our kids to this ex ex escape velocity. Our job is to get them to realize how proficient they really are how capable they really are, so that they choose to study abroad, so that they choose to engage with the Puerto Rican community in their neighborhood, right? So that they choose to continue to go on like most of us did. Those of us who are not like natively bilingual or heritage speakers and all that, at some point we decided that we were gonna take our learning into our own hands. Or no, is that the case? Right, we decided that we were gonna do that. So what we really wanna get our kids to do at that point is to realize that they're gonna do it too. But what better way to get them to internalize this idea of lifelong learning, but to model it in front of them. This is an opportunity to say, again, just because I'm Tinsley MED or PhD or EDD or whatever, I know y'all fancy, <laughs> with your degrees and all that, but I'm here learning in front of you. I'm a thousand years old with gray hair on my beard and all that, and I'm still a lifelong learner. I can't expect my students to do that if I won't model it for them. So in these moments when I say I'm not going to be the expert now, but we're gonna learn alongside you, is that I'm gonna model for you that idea of lifelong learning. And as you do that, just like any other learning thing, I'm gonna try to get all these up on the, on the thing here, is that these are skills like anything else. A biggie for me, as I've been doing this work over the last many years, is that I've gotten better at it. I've gotten better at finding sources, but I had to start by being bad. Like every other, like I had to, you know, I won't say being bad, but I, had to, I was not as good at finding good sources two years ago as I am now. But like any other learning process, I've been building upon that. And little things that have helped me, like figuring out some certain keywords that I can use to help me find those sources, right? I started by just Googling like Congolese cuisine. 
which gets a certain amount of results. But the more I studied that and the more I talked about, okay, so Kinshasa, Kinshasa is, the, is 15 million people there. There's 15 million people in Kinshasa, right? So now I can like look for different neighborhoods there and I can find a particular restaurant in Kinshasa and I can compare it to another restaurant's menu that I found in Casablanca. But it's the result of me having learned a little bit to start with that now I know where to look a little bit better, right? So that process is happening in real time and I have to give myself permission to not be great at it at first. But that's what intellectual, intellectual curiosity really looks like. That's what it really looks like in real time. We're not waiting to be experts before we start doing that for our students. And then a biggie here, and this gets mixed responses as well. But being willing to make adaptations to the things that we find. So if you find a source, right, I find one of the things that I really love are YouTube videos. I find really good YouTube videos. I find blog posts a lot that I really like. I find a number of different things. And you know when you, you, you may find something, but it's like just out of reach for your kids. It's like, this is a bit too long. Or like, I don't see how I'd be able to scaffold up to my kids being able to use this source. You can make adaptations to it. It won't make you a bad teacher, right? If our goal is eventually to get kids to demonstrate the main idea and supporting details of authentic texts that have not been modified, we have to take a step back and look at that larger scope of their proficiency growth if they're not there yet, then they're not there yet. Your job, your part of the assembly line that is the growth of this student is gonna be where they still need things sort of broken down into more comprehensible language for them. They're still gonna grow from that. They're still gonna learn all those things about themselves and about the cultural practices and products of other people and the similar and perhaps different perspectives that come from that. They're still gonna learn that when you adapt the text. And you'll learn how to do that. You'll learn what language you need. You'll learn what high frequency verbs are. You get better at doing that the more you practice it. But you can't wait to show up and be great at it on day one. You kind of got to flop and give yourself some space to flop for a little while. And I'm saying specifically that there's a, there's a benefit to that for your kids. There's a benefit to your kids seeing you. For example, when I come in and I talk about like one day, this, I was talking about ethnic groups in Northern Africa. And I know the term les Berbères, right? If you may have, whatever, it's like an indigenous group of people who are from Northern Africa. The majority, like 99% of people in Algeria are of this sort of family of this group of ethnicities. And so we talked about that in class. And then like two days later, I'm online and I see that that terminology is not really the preferred terminology for everyone in the community there. And so first I was like, Shh. sorry. Uh, <laughs> darn it. Yeah, I was embarrassed, right? And I was like, I made a huge mistake and I'm a mess and I just sent these kids out into the world with this false information or bad information. But all it took was the next day I came into class and I just told them exactly that. I was like, yeah, I just read this other article and I spoke to some other people online and stuff and I saw that this is actually like a more preferred term. So you'll probably see both. And like now I know. And that was it. Like now they have that and my kids know that. And no one like wrote me up for that. Like, oh, you weren't, you know what I'm saying? There were no negative consequences to that. And I'd argue that my students benefited from me being like, yeah, I'm, I learned something yesterday. Like I learned something yesterday, I sought out something new, and I sought out something new because I wanted to better see human beings. And I'm grateful for that, and I wanna share that with y'all. I believe my students benefited from that. I believe they benefited from that more than they would have benefited from me not doing it at all, because I, I've never been to Africa, by the way. Like Benjamin Tinsley, I've never been to the continent of Africa. I have been to France a thousand times, you know what I'm saying? I believe that they benefit more from me doing this work right now than they would if I were to just be like, well, I know what it's like to go to, I've never been all the way to the top of the Eiffel Tower, but like the second tier joint, I've been up there. I've got a weird thing with heights too, subjunctive and heights. Are like <laughs> <laughs> well, right, so that it's important for me to model that for my students. I believe that they get more from that as learners. I believe that they get more from that as human beings that we want to be putting out into the world or helping them 
grow as they're inevitably going to be out into the world, I believe that they gain more from me modeling that with them than they would if I didn't do it at all. So we got, of the three sort of like core practices, first we got backward design, right? Choosing a desired outcome, communicating that desired outcome to those students, having that desired outcome be specifically that we are going to compare and contrast the cultural practices and products of uh, in other cultures and in, in, in our own, and telling them that we're doing, specifically we're going to be centering historically marginalized people so that they know the justice work that they're involved in. We know Gen Z students, but really young people in general, they like to know the why. Why do we need to learn this? Y'all heard that before or no? This is my students. Why do we need to learn this? Imagine having like a real substantive answer to that question. Not just like, listen, you got to do some stuff sometimes, yeah? Right, like, or like next year's teacher is not gonna be as nice as me. Like those answers, <laughs> that's, my, that's my thing right now. Yeah. But yeah, so those answers don't really sit as well in my experience, they don't sit as well with students. But when we say, you know, there are people who have been overlooked and there are consequences to that in the ways that we see the world ourselves and the ways that we vote and the ways that we serve on juries and decisions that we make every day. And so our goal together is to broaden our horizons and, and to see the people of the world for all the richness that they bring to it. Because I, Benjamin Tinsley, black man from Long Island, New York, started studying French in seventh grade. I didn't start to see that black French speakers existed outside of music and helping France win the World Cup until I was a junior in college. But I took French, and there were three people in the program at that point who were still majoring in French. But I remember in seventh grade, there were like 40 of us. So the other 37 kids, yeah, 37. The other 37 kids, I'm a language teacher, y'all. Leave me alone. The other 37 kids never got to see that. So there's backward design, there's intellectual, modeling intellectual curiosity. In the moment, deciding that I am learning alongside my students. I'm not going to wait to be an expert. I'm going to start now and I'm gonna invite them alongside me in this, in this co-exploration so that I can learn and I have more tools linguistically than they do, but I'm sharing that with them so that we can better understand those things. And then the third piece is, I mentioned the first two are sort of like in the conceptual realm. The third piece is this practice called map talks. Map talks I did not invent map talks. Map talks were first developed by a teacher I think she's from Ohio, her name is Abra Koch, and really it's a low prep or no prep comprehensible input strategy in which, similar to a picture talk, where I could just put something, an image on the board or something, and then just start talking about it in the target language. So the image provides a certain amount of context for the meaning making of the language. So that if I'm looking at something, I'm like, yo, does the speaker have a green sweater on? And the kid, no. No, he does not have a green sweater on. He has a red sweater on. This is red, yeah? Somebody told me it was orange. This is not orange. Like, this is red? Okay. <laughs> Objectively, right? Like, it's not me? So using that imagery, using the image, and... Using the image allows for us to be able to give context to the language that we're doing, and there's ways that we can ask questions, and we'll work on this later, there's ways that we can structure the, the questions that we ask that make students engage in that negotiation of meaning that we know is what interpersonal communication is really about. Right? Interpersonal communication is where we have to negotiate meaning. We don't know the answers to the things, and in real time, we have to be able to go back and forth and negotiate. So using that, but instead of using a picture of a dude standing up here with a red sweater, you're gonna use a map. You're literally gonna be learning about the real world. And we can just project Google Maps and start asking questions. Start asking questions in a way that's gonna have our students engaged, make it so that they have to answer and demonstrate comprehension, and subconsciously, right, they're, they're, they're acquiring language on the subconscious level that we know language acquisition really happens because they're looking at something and they're just confirming or denying or they're either oring or they're giving you depending on what their, what their proficiency level is. And importantly, to one of our points that we talked about earlier, is that you don't have to wait until they're a junior in college to start doing this. 
right? This is something, I've done it with nine-year-olds. I taught a class last summer with like a bunch of kids who were in third and fourth grade. And they're able to do this. So we're learning about the world and we're able to do a bunch of different things as we do that. One of the benefits that come from that is that linguistically, again, it's gonna give us a concrete context upon which we can start adding any new information. If I wanna start learning about a cultural practice or product, I can do that sort of abstractly, but it helps to know where Senegal is. There's like real, I'll get into it in a second, but there's real cognitive benefits to being able to place this place and to then be able to retrieve that information. But linguistically also, I can establish meaning when I say Chestnut Hill is a river. No. <laughs> no, Chestnut Hill is not a river, right? So we do all these things and the kids are establishing meaning for language because they have context for these things. So linguistically, it gives us this opportunity to really have this concrete context upon which we can build this linguistic framework. What it also does is, uh, I talked about cognitively, there's this thing, this memorization technique that's called uh, the mind palace. You may or may not have heard, you did not ever hear about that? Y'all don't go on YouTube rabbit holes and just watch things? Yes. Okay. So, so the mind palace is, you can look it up and you will be up until four o'clock in the morning watching people do it. But it's this memorization technique that people will do. If you have like a series of tasks that you want to remember, you can use the context of something that's familiar to you to help you remember what those things are. So for example, if you need to, you know you need to buy some cat food, you gotta call your mom. I gotta call my mom. I gotta call my mom, remind me to call my mom. But you gotta, you gotta pick up cat food, you gotta call your mom, you gotta do whatever. I can envision those things in my house. Like I can picture this space with which I am already familiar and just envision a thing of cat food at the entrance on the little bench next to the door when I walk in the house. And then when I walk through the kitchen, I'm gonna go to the dining room and I see my mom there looking at me angrily, sitting next to her phone. I can envision that thing. And you can do all this stuff, and it is remarkable how well people are able to memorize things and remember tasks and remember all kinds of things because they're using the context of this visual place in which they can place those things. The same applies when we start learning about geography. We start learning, again, that Africa is not a country, right? Right? Yeah, Africa is not a country, Africa is a continent, right? And not only is it a continent, it's a really big continent and that there are distinct places and cultures and identities and ethnicities and languages and multiple languages. And, you know, multilingualism is not unique to Europe. Europe is not the home of multilingualism, right? Monolingualism is probably the minority. That's weird that we don't, you know what I'm saying? So um, that we can picture these things is what's going to allow students to better be able to retrieve them. It's weird, but I promise you when kids can see this place and they've studied what the neighboring countries are, they remember where the capital is. The capital of Benin is right on the coast of the Gulf of Guinea, right? And they can see it. Then later on when I'm asking about what was that popular uh, mode of transport that came from Cotonou and Benin? They, I, I'm telling you, my kids will close their eyes and they can see it. Or les émigrants. They can picture it because it allow, they can better retrieve that information because they've placed it. So there's linguistic benefits, there's uh, uh, the cognitive benefits. We also, if you're familiar with teaching proficiency through reading and storytelling, TPRS, anybody familiar with that? So one of the things that Blaine Ray talked about in the framework is that to tell a story and to sort of build, excuse me, co-create a story with your students that you have three locations in that story. In location one, you're gonna establish a problem, so the character like, is hungry and has no food or something. And then they're gonna to travel to location two where they try to solve that problem, but unsuccessfully. And then they go to location three where they try to solve that problem and they solve it, right? So building it like that is sort of like foundational part of TPRS. Well, a lot of times when we build those stories, we'll use like local places. All right, the kid was hungry, so he went to Wawa. And at Wawa, he tried to order like a filet mignon, and they don't, apparently they don't serve that. At Wawa, I tried. Late night college Wawa runs. <laughs> they don't serve it at Wawa. But then so, you know, they go to a steakhouse, whatever. And all that works. But imagine being able to actually use real places in the world in that story. Imagine being able to, having your students be so sort of culturally aware and having so, such a depth of knowledge 
that our story can have someone starting at Wawa, but then they go to Tuba. And our students know that Tuba is a city in the middle of Senegal. And that in Tuba, because like most of Senegal, the majority of people there practice Islam, they're Muslim. And they also speak three or four other languages, one of which is Wolof. And the way that people greet people, even if French is their primary language, there's a solid chance that instead of saying bonjour, they say nangadef. That our students know that. So that's built into the story and that can help drive the, the logic of the story. So even if linguistic proficiency were the bottom line, I can achieve that goal by stepping away from the explicit grammar instruction for a second and building upon their cultural awareness and their intercultural proficiency, I can better uh, uh, build their linguistic proficiency when I do that. Another thing that comes from this, I'm gonna wrap up in a second, y'all, we'll get started, is that when I do map talks, it's always important that we start from home. Starting from home in a map talk has really set the stage for otherwise the ways that I, that I, that I frame the units. Because when I look at a map, there's a solid chance that our kids are familiar with the fact that Philadelphia is in southeast Pennsylvania, right? There's a really good chance that they know that Philadelphia is not an ocean, but that it's a city. So I can establish meaning to the language by starting from home in the map talk stage. And then later on, when I go to Senegal, when I go to Martinique, I can start using that same language that they just acquired when they were talking about home. They know the word for, for mountain because we talked about the Poconos. They know the word for island because Mr. Tinsley's from Long Island and we talked about that. They know the word for, you know what I'm saying? They know the word for capital. They know the word for city. They know the word for beach. They, know the, they understand the language for that, that. Now they can better understand it and apply it when we go to study another place. And when I start from home with the map talks, what it establishes also, in addition to establishing meaning, is that it builds this idea, again, that if we're going to learn from another culture, that we also have culture, like I mentioned. We do a map talk at home. And then, if we're learning about music from Senegal, what are popular styles of music here? If we're going to compare it to what are we going to compare it? You know, if our goal we established in the beginning of our unit design that we wanted to compare and contrast. So you can't compare and contrast if you don't have something to compare it to. So it establishes that that culture thing is not just of the other. And importantly, this has been big for me in my classroom over the last two years in particular, is that when we start from home with the map talk and with our study of a cultural practice product or perspective, it establishes that everyone counts. Every member of my class has a say in what it is that we're going to study. When we do a question about, I have a unit that I do about religions, and religions that are, we go to Benin, we learn about like the origins of what we know as voodoo, and then we go to like uh, le Liban, Lebanon, and we talk about les Chaldeans, this is really random like sect of Catholicism that whatever. We learn about the Shiite and all that kind of stuff. So first we start asking, what do religious identities look like in our school, in our community? And that puts the students in the center of their study, right? We necessarily have to learn about and have to, have to talk about what religious identities are there. And one of the times that I did this, we're going through and kids, of course, are like, you know, Christianity. We think most of our students probably identify as Christian. We're establishing meaning to all that language as we're going up and doing all that. And I have a girl. Gurbani, who raises her hand. She's like, there are also Sikhs in our school. I was like, tell me more. Gurbani herself is Sikh and has otherwise never seen that on the board to be studied and talked about. And when we put together a little pie chart of what the different religious identities are in our community, she saw that sliver that was for her. And she mentioned that to me when she graduated, how meaningful that was, that for the first time she was able to talk about, I did not know the name, for example, the name, we talk about the names of like the houses of worship of all these different places. I never knew what that was. Y'all know what that is? She was able to share that. It's called a Gurdwara. I didn't know that. In that moment, Gurbani got to teach me something. And we all learned about it. And we used that language when we studied all kinds of other things. She mattered in that moment. Every kid in that classroom matters. And sometimes this Gurbani being able to share her experiences through her identity as a Sikh, 
But sometimes it's just as simple as like, I don't get to say what popular styles of music are because I'm a thousand years old. <laughs> so y'all tell me, you know what I'm saying? Like y'all tell me what, what's popular here. I, I probably, I definitely can't also say what are the most popular styles of music somewhere else. But like y'all are gonna be the ones, this is your life. When we look at the other proficiency benchmarks, it's specific, all of them say this. They say in familiar topics. And then they start to build upon what familiar topics are. Some concrete topics, some research topics as they get more farther along in their proficiency, in their proficiency journey. But familiar topics, what's a familiar topic? Can I decide what's a familiar topic for that kid? No, like, right? Like it's their stuff. So they want to talk about what a familiar topic for them is going to be the music that they listen to. So when I start from home with my, with my map talks and I start from home with our study and our analysis of cultural practices and products, it allows for us to say, y'all count. The things that you do, the music that, you, when you listen to music, having an AirPod in your ear throughout my entire class, that's a cultural practice, right? The ways how we interact with music, when we listen to it, do we dance all the time here? Is that a thing? Do your family parties, do people dress a certain way? At a wedding, what does a wedding look like for y'all? You know what I'm saying, what music do y'all listen to? What's the song that will get your grandmother out of her seat? Like that's different for every kid and we're able to talk about that and every kid in our class is able to see that they matter when we do that. So we'll talk about this a little bit more, but how do we actually do this map talk thing? And again, I mentioned earlier that it's this low prep to like no prep, no prep to low prep activity that fortunately is accessible to students of all levels. Like again, I've done it with all kinds of students. Step one is just gonna be to open Google Maps. So if you go to maps.google.com or you can just go to Google and just type in maps and click what comes up, boom, here we are. Step two is that I'm gonna to go to this upper left-hand corner. You see I got these three lines right here. These are from my settings. And if I click on that, it's gonna give me all these options. And down all, almost all the way at the bottom is language. And this is where I can change it into the target language. And now I can just start asking questions in the target language. And I can say, class, this is Chestnut Hill. This happens in whatever language it is, and again, with any level. Class is Chestnut Hill. Is Chestnut Hill a town? Are we in Chestnut Hill? And Coralie, everyone says yes. It's like, is Chestnut Hill an ocean? Now in French, I'm leaning on the fact that ocean is a cognate, and they know that Chestnut Hill is not an ocean. I, th I think most of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, let's not take things for granted. But the majority of our students know that Chestnut Hill is not an ocean. Also, the majority of our students, even though they may have grown up here and never left and all that kind of stuff, they may not know when I zoom out a little bit. They know that they're in La Pennsylvanie, but à l'est, c'est le New Jersey. Le New Jersey est à l'est ou au nord de l'état de Pennsylvanie. They know that Jersey's not far from here, but now, but they also know, they may not know that it's to the east, but now we're using a bit of their schema, of their background knowledge, and just one step out of their, pro their zone of proximal development, right? Just one little bit outside of what they know for a fact. So now I'm, uh, they're engaged that much more because it's like, oh no, Jersey's to the east. Is the capital of Pennsylvania Harrisburg? Yes. Is Harrisburg the capital of the United States? No, no, right? Harrisburg's not the capital. What is the capital of the United States? Is Philadelphia the capital of the United States? Was Philadelphia the capital of the United States? Now we're speaking across time frames, in context, right? So these kids know that they're using their background knowledge to apply to this real negotiation of meaning that's happening in real time. And I don't need to teach about the imparfait in order for them to know Philadelphia is not currently the capital, but it was the capital. I don't need to have a whole lesson about every form of every verb in the imparfait. This is a context that makes sense, and ite happens to be a really high frequency verb for them to be able to put into a bunch of other contexts, right? So we're able to use all that stuff to start applying here at home. So that later on, when I've talked about the rivers, the main river, le fleuve, Dela le Delaware, c'est un fleuve ou un océan? C'est une montagne, le Delaware? 
right? We've established all this language for what a river is. We've established for what on the border of, how to say next to, all that. Then when I say, okay, class, aujourd'hui, on va traverser l'océan Atlantique. Et on arrive en Afrique. Classe. L'Afrique, c'est un continent ou un pays? Hey! <laughs> Africa is not a country. It is a continent, right? So we're using all that same sort of stuff, and I can zone in and start talking about all this stuff. L'Afrique, il y a cette région d'Afrique appelée l'Afrique de l'Ouest. L'Afrique de l'Ouest, c'est une région. Il y a beaucoup de pays en Afrique de l'Ouest. Par exemple... Le Bénin. Classe, le Bénin est un grand pays ou un petit pays C'est un petit pays. Le Bénin est bordé par quel pays à l'est Le Nigeria. All of that can happen at any level because I just did it at home. We just established all that language and then again they're building their geographical awareness, they're doing all that. And then I start talking about, so, la Côte d'Ivoire, classe, la Côte d'Ivoire est un pays francophone. On parle français en Côte d'Ivoire. Pourquoi? What am I asking? Why? Why do we speak French there so we can have this conversation about whether or not or that it was a colony? But importantly, we also, so that's the no prep version, right? But the slight prepped version, and I'll share with you in a little bit, is one in which I do a little bit of background knowledge before I get in there to talk about ethnic groups that are there, common religions that are practiced, what the population of a city is, you know what I'm saying, other languages that are spoken. And so when we learn about La Cote d'Ivoire, we learn that the largest ethnic group there is Akan, the Akan people, or A-K-A-N. Well, next door to the east is Ghana. Is Ghana a French-speaking country also in people? It is not, but the largest ethnic group there is Akan. How could that be? They don't even speak the same language. How could it be that the neighboring country also has the same ethnic group? Now I'm having a conversation about these borders having been, having been drawn not by the Akan people. We're talking about 1960s, that these countries became independent in 1960. What was happening with black people in the United States in 1960? All of these conversations have happened, right? that black liberation movements were not in isolation of one another. We have conversations about, all right, so we're going to talk about le Sénégal, le premier président du Sénégal. Léopold Senghor était le premier président du Sénégal. Léopold Senghor was the first president of Senegal. He was also one of the founding fathers of the Negritude movement. There was a literary, philosophical, and political movement in the black French-speaking world in the 1930s class. What was happening in the United States? in the 1930s with black philosophers, writers, the Harlem Renaissance. Songa and Claude McKay and Langston Hughes were friends, right? So this interdiscipline, and I, I can do this with seventh graders. I've had this conversation, 80, 90% of this conversation is in the target language. And when they know, they just, we just studied the Harlem Renaissance in history class, Mr. Tinsley. We just talked about this in history. We just talked about the civil rights movement. And so now we're able to make those connections. Now I'm able, rude. <laughs> How dare you, first of all. Um, now we're able to, again, to talk about population size. I can spend 25 minutes in class having my kids reach, establish Philadelphia is a large city, yeah? It's a large city. And so what's the population of Philadelphia? I ask my kids, what's the population of Philly? And one kid guesses and they're gonna say like, oh, it's 500,000. Like, all right, it's not 500,000. How many people think it's more? How many people think it's less? And now it's a competition. And once something becomes a competition in my classroom, tables get flipped, <laughs> alliances are formed, all this. And we go back and forth, all right, so someone else says 10 million. I'm like, all right, it's not 10 million. How many people think it's above, it's more than 10 million? How many people think it's less? We do that for 30 minutes. And we eventually land on the fact that Philadelphia's population is about 1,600,000. Yeah? We just said that it's a large city. It's the sixth largest city in the United States. So now, when we start studying La République Démocratique du Congo, and we go to Kinshasa, and we learn that there's 15 million people there, we just said Philly was a big city. 
There's only 1.6 people. There's 15 million French speakers in Kinshasa. What does that really mean? What does that mean in terms of infrastructure? What does that mean in terms of public transportation? What does that mean in terms of you know, public education and those sorts of things? So I'm not, I say all this and I give you these long drawn out examples because I'm not using culture to teach numbers. I'm using numbers to help build our understanding of people around the world, right? We did all that. Y'all know French teachers, you know how hard it is to get kids to know like 70, 80, 90, all that. But that's when I'm just trying to randomly get them to remember it. But when you start talking about like he was president from 1960 to 1980. Was he president until 1990? No, he wasn't president until 1990. Now the number 90 has context for them. The number 80, they're not thinking four 20s <laughs> like we had to do, you know what I'm saying? Now that makes sense. They, they, they contextually can see the idea of what 1980 is. They contextually can see that the population of Philadelphia is not 1,500,000 but it's 1, 1, 600,000, right? They, they can see numbers in context. They can see what it means in terms of like what a large city is and all that. We can apply that information when we go somewhere else. So that's as I'm doing it in just the map talk itself. And I'm, I, I, I shared with y'all, you'll have access to like a little worksheet that I use that's for the low prep version where I can just go on Wikipedia before I do this in class, and I can, again, look up, like, what are the names of some lakes? What are some rivers? What are some of the ethnicities there? What percentage of people practice this religion? Because I may just want to spend 10 minutes talking about that, right? Um, and where it sits in my unit building. And this is like a really skeletal, y'all don't see this screen right now, do you? Let me get over here. This is like a skeletal sort of, there's so much more to this unit, but this is just looking at it from its bare bones, whatever. This unit that I have on, on La Musique, where we study La Musique, where we have our three locations, we start from home, and we do a map talk. We talk about what's, you all have access to all that. Feel free to take pictures and all that too, but I will share all of this with you. Um, we do a map talk of home. Where are we? What is home? Right, my school is in Fort Washington, so we do all this talking about like Fort Washington. There's a creek that runs through our campus. It's super bougie up there. But <laughs> we like to know the word for creek. They know that the Wissahickon is not, you know, a lake. It's a creek. So we do all that. We're talking about what our community is. Where are we? Why is Germantown Academy in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania? That's, I mean, there's a story behind that, right? So Germantown Academy was in Germantown. And then there's the miracle of Fort Washington that is, I'm telling you this, I just had this conversation, it was one of the original examples of white flight. And so we can have that conversation. That one's probably 60-40 in the target language and in English, but so? Like that's real, relevant, familiar topics to them, whatever. So we're doing that map talk. And then I start asking like, what are some popular styles of music here? And we can create lists. We can rank them, we can make predictions about like which one, if we survey, when we survey the rest of our school community, which one do you think is gonna be the most popular? And then all these debates happen, like you really think that country music is the most popular style of music? Yeah, well, I, I mean, there's a lot of people who really like country music. All those conversations are happening as we're just trying to come up with what does this cultural practice or product look like, look like in our community? What different instruments people played too, because they love doing that. It's like, yo, I remember you used to play the violin, man. You was terrible. In middle school, you used to play the violin. <laughs> and they were cracking on each other. But again, do you still play violin? You play violin? And they're like, no, I don't play anymore. But you used to play? Yeah, I used to play violin. We're speaking across time frames again in a familiar topic, in a familiar situation, right? They love to be able to talk about what they used to do when they were younger, what games they used to play, what TV shows they used to watch. That's not a lesson on the imparfait. That's a lesson about their lives. You know what I'm saying? They're using their own lived experience to inform whether or not they can actually use the language to connect with another human being at some point. But then, so we jumped to Senegal and everything that we learned, all the language that we acquired from our map talks and from talking about styles of music, you said, yeah, y'all said you like, some, some people here said they liked hip hop music. Well, hip hop music, where's that from? What is hip hop music? How, what are the primary instruments in jazz music, right? We talked about those things, somebody talked about rock music. What instruments are the primary instruments in, in, in rock music? Is a guitar a brass instrument or is it a string instrument, right? All those conversations, we learned all that sort of stuff to be able to go to Senegal and we can do a map talk of Senegal. 
We can learn all about people there. We can learn all about other languages that are spoken. We can all learn all about religions that are practiced there. To then learn about this style of music that comes from Senegal that's called Mbaraks. And we can learn about when that style of music became popular. Who are, some, who are the people who are considered to be like the most popular artists in that style? What are the primary instruments? Right? What are some other traditional West African instruments? What, do those, what instruments do they resemble that we're familiar with and all that? And now that they have language to make context, to have context. They have context to build upon their linguistic proficiency there. And then for our third location, we go to Martinique or, or Les Antilles in general. And we do a map talk there and we learn like, hey, Senegal was a colony. Martinique was a colony. Senegal is an independent country. Is Martinique an independent country? No, Martinique is not an independent country. It's un département d'outre-mer. Right, so it's, a depart it's an overseas department of France. So we start learning about, again, speaking across time frames, with that different history. Why is Martinique what it is today? How has that informed their experience? People who live, African people who live in Martinique today, how is their experience different than people who were also colonized in Senegal? Or what do they have in common? You know what I'm saying? What are the different ethnic makeups when we look at that? We're learning about indigenous peoples. We're learning about les Taino and les Arawak, and you know, people who, indigenous peoples from the, from the Caribbean. We do map talks of all that, and then we learn about La Biguine. La Biguine is a style of music that's heavily influenced by New Orleans jazz. And one of the primary instruments there is the clarinet. Somebody played clarinet here, didn't they? Right? So we learn all about that in our classroom that somebody used to play. We learn about this style of music that is like a blend of New Orleans jazz and then polka. Right? So like polka, why is polka an influence there? Well, because people were coming from France and bringing their influences too. So it's these blends of like African music and indigenous music influences and European musical influences because those are the people who live in Martinique. Those are the makeup of the people who live in Martinique. So I have this framework for my unit and then at the end I have a story. I have a story in which there's a character who goes to like upper Dublin or something like that, whatever. And it's a kid who really wants to play in a band. We established that kid desperately wants to play in a band, but unfortunately, there are no musicians at her school. And so she travels to Tuba. And my kids are like, oh, Tuba, that's the city, that's the big city that's like not on the coast, that's the city that's in Senegal. She goes to Tuba and she goes to La Grande Mosquée. La Grande Mosquée, the great mosque in Tuba. And they know that because we talked about that as a monument. And they know that the majority of people in Senegal practice Islam and all that. And she goes to the imam and she says, do you know? And they know what an imam is because we talked about that too. She goes to the imam and she's like, do you know anybody who's like looking for a musician? I'm really, like I want to play in a band. And do you know anybody that's looking for a musician? And the imam says, yes. My nephew is an Mbalak singer and he's looking for a percussionist. She's like, ah, that's too bad. I don't play percussion. I play clarinet. And 100% of the kids in my class go, she's going to Martinique. <laughs> Why though? Why is every kid now saying, I know what the next step of this story is? Because they have some sort of cultural background knowledge. Their schema has now grown. So again, just the, like TPRS tends to focus just on the linguistic proficiency, but we're able to use this sort of interdisciplinary knowledge to help build that. And so now our kid, this character ends up going to Martinique and they go to like this, whatever this market, and they meet some dude and they ask the dude, are you looking for anybody who wants to? And there's a million other details that you build in across there. Is she tall? Does she have long hair? Does she have what color her eyes? All that kind of stuff. So you can use language to talk about all these other things. But then she ends up whatever. He's like, yeah, we're looking for a clarinetist or we're looking for a woodwind player. It's like, oh, it's cool. She plays clarinet. She, she can play in this band, right? All that happens in the target language because I've established not just three places, but I've established that the first one of those places is home and that we know something about that cultural practice or product from home, that the second place, is that a, what is that? Is that a fly? Okay. Keep an eye on it for me, somebody, can y'all? And then all of that happens. And again, this is just the bare sort of like skeletal version of what this unit looks like and units can look like. So, um, that's that. I'd like to, I shared with the facilitators, there's a sheet of some of the things that we can do. One of the first steps that I'd like everybody to do once we get into our breakout spaces 
is to just see if we can get to opening Google Maps and changing the target language. I mean, that's been a challenge for some of us. And then to be able to navigate, can we zoom in, can we zoom out, can we scroll to another place, right? Getting that sort of technical piece, again, is a skill that we can build. And we'll see some of the extension activities that we can do when we get there, when we get to the place where we're feeling more comfortable with it, and even how to start framing our questions, right? So when we get there, we're gonna, again, see if we can open it up, see if we can navigate uh, zooming in and zooming out, and then looking at asking questions. This, in this space, we're all, I think we're all from this area. Everybody's like from around here-ish, yeah. So sometimes when I do workshops and stuff, it's people from all over the place. But here, fortunately, we kind of all know where we are. So see if we can start asking questions, see how well we can start with, even with a partner or a small group. Start asking questions about where we are. We are now at Chestnut Hill College. Is that an elementary school? You know, things like that that we can just start engaging and to what extent can we stretch that conversation out. All right? I want to say thank you all so much for listening to me this morning and for taking the time to be out here. It's been nothing short of a pleasure working with you. And there's ways to be in touch with me as well that I'm, I'm sure will go out. And I'm excited to hear about all the great things that you're doing in your own classrooms. And I'm excited to work with the French, the French speaking, y'all are French teachers? Yeah, I'm excited to work with y'all um, in the next space. Thank you. <laughs>